it's a humbling experience to be before so many guests, distinguished guests, uh, to launch this, my second book, uh, on the prosecution of Dato Seri Anwar Ibrahim. Uh, how fitting that it should be in this building, uh, because my journey as an international observer began here in 2002, because it was to this club that those associated with Kapil Singh's first edition trial in 2002 crossed that very dangerous road when the prosecution against him spluttered out uh, in 2002, as I say. Uh, if you recall, Kapil had raised uh, serious issues concerning his client, Dr. Uh, Seri Ibrahim, about that he was being poisoned. And that had come about because there had been blood tests carried out. He was charged because of words that he spoke in court. And it was the first time in the Commonwealth that a lawyer had been charged with saying things on behalf of his client in court. Of course, at the end of the day, uh, the very recently former uh, Attorney General, uh, I think it was his first act, uh, uh, withdrew the charge, as it should have been. <clears throat> and now, 13 years later, here we are again. Uh, of course, I don't for a moment think that you would be here, but for the subject matter of my book uh, and its implications for Malaysia uh, as a modern democratic nation. I would never have thought when the former Chief Justice of Western Australia, David Malcolm, uh, asked me to represent Law Asia at Karpal Singh's sedition trial in 2002, and again in 2004 at Anwar Ibrahim's uh, appeal against the, the, the sedition charge, I never thought for a moment that we'd be here once again. And yet here we are, almost 17 years later, uh, the same problems continue to plague Malaysia. Uh, it would be difficult to imagine that this whole situation would develop over such a long period of time. And that's the story that's recorded in this book, uh, to actually record what happened. It was critical, uh, and I was urged by a number of people, to record the day-to-day -day events that took place so that not only Malaysians but that the international community could understand what had taken place in this country. Uh, and it was important that my account be impartial and independent. Uh, at times, I must tell you, I was critical of both the defence and the prosecution, and contrary to what my critics have said, uh, there were no favourites. And then, because I was a, a lawyer experienced in the criminal law, I wanted to make a final objective assessment of Anwar's acquittal and his subsequent appeals, conviction and imprisonment. Of course, this book wasn't just written for lawyers. Uh, it was important that everybody read the account. So it wasn't just about what happened in the courtroom. I tried to capture the moment, if you will, uh, by the descriptions not only of the court hearings, uh, but the public demonstrations and the colourful characters that were pitched against each other in this mammoth struggle for justice. The court hearings of 2014-15 weren't as dramatic as the appeal in 2004, uh, which I attended along with other international observers. Uh, I was at the federal court to witness Anwar's conviction on the 10th of February 2015 and to hear his dramatic declaration of innocence uh, to the court. I'm sure the judges, in allowing Anwar to speak, expected him to be uh, humble and contrite. Uh, but that didn't happen. Uh, that was just another error of judgment on their part. Because as they say in Western movies, he gave it to them with both barrels. Uh, and you will see in the book that there was a video of Anwar as he made his speech and they very cleverly cut the, the actual video into, into three frames, which I think essentially captures the, dr the drama of that moment. But Anwar's, Anwar's statement was, in my view, as historically important as Nelson Mandela's Declaration of Innocence at the Rivonia trial in 1964. 
The full statement that Anwar made is recorded in the book and it was important that it be there in its complete form. But I think his final words were worth repeating. He said this, and I quote, Going to jail, I consider a sacrifice I make for the people of this country. I have fought most of my life on behalf of the people of this country. For the people, I'm willing to go to jail or face any other uh, consequence. My struggle will continue wherever I am sent and whatever is done to me. To my friends and fellow Malaysians, let me thank you from the bottom of my heart for all your support uh, you have given me. And Allah is my witness. I pledge and I will not be silenced. I will fight on for freedom and justice and I will never surrender. By then, the judges could take it no longer and they stormed out of the courtroom. <laughs> but they later returned and had their vengeance because they sentenced him to five years in prison. Yet even in defeat, Anwar was dignified and upbeat as usual. He moved around the courtroom shaking hands uh, with the supporters and thanking them for their support. He hugged and farewelled his tearful family before court security finally led him away. Uh, the crowds outside the court building were not as large as they were in 2004, but they were equally as vocal and colourful. Uh, I think everyone was just worn out after 16 years of conflict and struggle. Now remember, of course, the trial had taken almost two years and the appeal process another 12 months, so three years in total. Yet it was an incredible story uh, with many dramatic twists and turns that interests not only Malaysians, but also the international community. It was my privilege to tell it the way it happened, to report it as I saw, saw it. My firm view was the book, if it was to be credible, was vitally important that I remained the dispassionate observer of the legal process, the mere narrator of events. But not everyone saw me as an independent observer. My periodic reports to the IPU at Geneva were harshly condemned by the Malaysian delegation to the IPU. Uh, but that was to be expected. Uh, more attention was paid to attacking my account of what happened than focusing on the real issues. And simply, was, the view was taken that simply because I took a, a view of the court proceedings uh, that made me biased, that made me an opposition lackey, that made me a mouthpiece for Anwar's legal teams. Well, you know most of Anwar's legal teams, and it'd be very hard to be a mouthpiece for them, I can assure you. They're quite capable of speaking on their own behalf, and certainly spoke most eloquently on behalf of Anwar at the appeals. It didn't mean, however, that I favoured one party against the other. But that's politics. I expected uh, that, that uh, um, reaction. And what better way to distract than to shoot the messenger? Uh, uh, political observers find it difficult to, to accept that lawyers are capable of putting aside personal opinions and prejudices and acting objectively and impartially. Uh, but the ultimate question remains nevertheless. It is this. It was whether the criminal charge brought against Anwar Ibrahim could be proved to the standard of proof required in criminal trials. Having analysed the evidence dispassionately and objectively before the courts and applying accepted legal principles, in my opinion, the evidence was insufficient to convict him. Uh, I wrote this in the book at, at page 380. The true test of whether the offence occurred was whether the evidence was sufficient to prove the charge beyond a reasonable doubt. For the reasons briefly explored in this report, my view is that it was not sufficient to that standard of proof and that Anwar should have been acquitted. Uh, I'm still of that view. And if you want to know why, well, you just have to read the book. Citizens uh, of any nation can only have confidence in their legal system if they are satisfied that decisions have been reached according to law. It's not about one side winning or losing, but whether an accused person has had a fair trial according to the law. Justice must always guide 
courts to a fair and just result. This is the fundamental principle that underpins a modern democratic nation. It is what it is meant by a nation being subject to the rule of law. In 1963, <clears throat> civil rights leader Martin Luther King Jr in what is known as the letter from Birmingham jail, spoke about the distinction between law and justice. He was at that time in solitary confinement in a cell in Birmingham, Alabama, and some portions of the letter were written and gradually smuggled out by King's lawyers on scraps of paper, including uh, some reports, rough jailhouse toilet paper. King had been arrested while participating in a peaceful anti-segregation march on the grounds that he did not have a parade permit. Could you imagine that happening in recent years? You couldn't, could you? Uh, but the segregation laws and politics were part, policies were part of the government-sanctioned racial oppression that mandated separate schools, separate restaurants, bathrooms for blacks and whites. This is what King wrote. <clears throat> I submit that an individual who breaks a law that conscience tells him is unjust and who willingly accepts the penalty of imprisonment in order to arouse the conscience of the community over its injustice is in reality expressing the highest respect for the law. End of quote. By no means am I quoting Martin King to encourage you to break the law. Far from it. But I've quoted him to highlight the point that the law, even if uniformly applied, does not of itself guarantee a just result. Change is best brought about by democratic means, but the human spirit's quest for liberty cannot be easily crushed. As the great authoritarian regimes that have collapsed in the last 20 or 30 years have found, the rule of law is intended to promote stability but a society that operates under the rule of law must also remain vigilant to ensure that the rule of law also serves the interests of justice. It's not difficult, uh, and it's not a difficult concept to understand. The interests of justice can only ever be served by independent and politically impartial courts strictly applying established legal principles to the evidence that is put before it and nothing else. It's for Malaysians to judge whether they are well served by their legal system, not foreign observers. It would be impolite as a guest in this country, for which I have much affection, to offer opinions about issues that are exclusively for Malaysians to decide. Nevertheless, modern democratic nations are judged by whether they adhere to international standards that we accept as fundamental for good governance. These are the standards by which the prosecution of Anwar Ibrahim should be judged and will ultimately be judged by all Malaysians and the international community. Citizens in modern democratic nations have every right to expect that their legal system will be fair, impartial and independent. That, after all, is the hallmark of a free society, a society not ruled by law but by the rule of law. Those of us in Western democracies sometimes take our legal protections for granted, mostly because they are really under threat, at least in an overt way. <clears throat> we speak easily of these concepts, <clears throat> but this easy rhetoric only has true meaning when those rights and values are threatened and need defending. We need to constantly remind ourselves that these principles are not just empty phrases, that sometimes we must fight for a just and a free society, that the law should protect and guarantee essential freedoms for all. In Australia, where I come from, we take most things for granted, uh, particularly our easy way of life. We criticise our politicians, judges, bureaucrats and the monarchy with immunity. Uh, people probably take offence, but, but there's no criminal charge that results from, from being critical of everything and everyone. In fact, we do complain about everything, but that's healthy, is it not? Uh, it shows that democracy is at work. It also means that we should be more vigilant when there are attempts to undermine, undermine our essential protections. Uh, we Australians fight when we need to, and we've proved that 
in, in countless wars, including the war against the communist insurgency in, in Malaya in the 1960s. And because of that, we regard Malaysia as an old friend, a true friend. Uh, citizens of democratic countries often need to remind themselves of a number of things. First, that speaking out for freedom and justice should not be unlawful. Secondly, that assembling to express dissent about unjust laws is an integral part of the democratic process. Thirdly, that the voice of the people is not something to be feared, but rather listened to and respected. Fourthly, that diversity and dissent should be embraced as a positive factor that makes a country comfortable with itself and its people. And finally, that true accountability is something that the people should demand of their politicians and which they in turn should accept as essential in a democratic parliamentary system. So may I conclude by saying once more how grateful and humble I am uh, that, uh, for that you've come here tonight uh, for the launch of this book. It took a lot of effort to condense all the things that happened over the last 17 years into uh, the, the covers of a, a pretty narrow book, I suppose. And I hope I've done it justice, and I hope I've done the people in it justice. My reward is to be here with you tonight and to share my account. You may not agree with all that I've written, uh, but after all, it's a lawyer's account and it's a foreigner's account. Uh, so forgive me if I've missed things, some things that you may have thought were more important or spent too much time on things, things that you thought were unimportant. Nevertheless, it was, it was critical that these significant events in the life of Malaysia be recorded for all to read. And hopefully it ultimately makes a difference. Uh, can I just end by expressing my appreciation to a number of people, some that you may not regard as deserving of, of, of praise, but in a way, uh, they, they do. First of all, to the uh, Honourable Michael Kirby, former uh, Judge Justice of the High Court of Australia, for his insightful forward to the book, <coughs> to, the, <coughs> to the publishers, Marshall Cavendish, who took, took a hell of a chance, you know, in, in, in printing this. And, uh, and, and, but they stood by the first book and they were keen to do the second as well. Uh, and, uh, particularly to the editor, Maylin Lee, who brought all of my disjointed reports into a coherent narrative. Uh, to the international organisations that I represented at the various court appearances, and they all, they're all listed in the book. I need not uh, um, recite it now. To Datuk David Yo, whose great support and uh, assistance was simply invaluable. Uh, without which this book may never have come to be. So I think you should be all grateful for that. Thank you, Dave. <clears throat> to Justice Zabadin, who with great tolerance allowed me to sit in his court uh, next to the press and special branch officers <laughs> to, to monitor what was taking place. But it was, it was a courtesy that he extended to me. To the Chief Justice and the President of the Court of Appeal, who again allow the international observers to be present at these hearings, and without which they wouldn't probably have been observed and reported upon. They may have some reservations about, about that now, but, uh, but nevertheless, it was, a, it was a, uh, a graciousness that was extended to us. To all the Defence Council, and to some of the prosecutors, most of, most of whom were suspicious of the international observers, but... Uh, there were some exceptions, but, but at least they, they cooperated as well. Uh, and of course, uh, Shafi Abdullah, well, you, you couldn't stop him talking to us. So, in fact, as from what I hear, you can't stop him talking to anybody. So I feel this is my road trip <laughs> uh, uh, to the court staff and the police security. Uh, they were very uh, helpful and cooperative. And finally, to someone, I suppose, who really must be the, the star of the book, and that's uh, Dada Seri Anwar Ibrahim. He was always available to patiently discuss all aspects of the legal proceedings and what he saw as his vision for Malaysia. He, also, he always was steadfast in his resolve that justice would see him through. But if it didn't, then he was quite prepared to sacrifice himself for the good of Malaysia. 
and, and Malaysia has done itself a great disservice in the way he has been treated. He also graciously allowed me to record his thoughts for the book, and, and you'll see there is an interview with him. And, 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 and finally, not to be forgotten, uh, is, uh, all the family members of Anwar Ibrahim, who were also always available to talk, and, and it was interesting to see that, that very personal side of the case. So to all of those people, may I express my deep gratitude um, and conclude my remarks by saying this, may peace, harmony and justice reign in Malaysia. Uh, Terima kasih.